Hey, Sound City Church family, Aaron here. Happy New Year. Hope that you're doing well. I um, want to take just a few minutes and invite you to consider something here in this new year. Uh, if you've been around for any length of time at all, you know that I'm not particularly big about New Year's resolutions because New Year's resolutions, well, more often than not, they just end in failure. We don't always live up to the resolutions we put before us, but the new year is a good time to stop and evaluate certain things in our lives and habits and practices and things that we want to have be a regular part of our lives. And um, as a staff team, towards the end of this last year, 2022, we were reading a book together as a staff that really emphasized the importance of Sabbath. And Sabbath is something that is a spiritual discipline that has been a real blessing for my life. It's something that I've mentioned in my sermons a few times over the last few months. And as we enter into this new year, we thought it would be good as a church staff to just invite you to consider making the practice and the habit, the spiritual discipline, if you want to call it that, of the Sabbath, something that's important in your life. And so if you allow me just to spend a few minutes explaining, first of all, why should we even practice the Sabbath? What, what, what's the deal? Why, why should I consider this? And I'll give you four reasons. Number one, the Bible says that the Sabbath is a gift. In Mark chapter 2, when Jesus is talking with the religious leaders uh, about their Sabbath rules and things that they've added to the scriptures, Jesus says, hey, remember, Sabbath was created for man, not man for the Sabbath. And that means it's a gift from God. It's for us. It's for our good. It's for our blessing. And when we fail to Sabbath, we actually miss out on uh, some of the blessing that God has for us. So Sabbath is a gift. Number two, Sabbath is a reminder. For the people of Israel, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, as they're getting ready to go into this new promised land, God reiterates his commandments. He reiterates the Ten Commandments. He reiterates the commandment to Sabbath. And he says to the people of Israel, remember that you used to be slaves in Egypt. You used to be forced to work all the time. You used to have no freedom, no liberty, no rest. And remember that our God is a, a liberating God, a God who sets us free from slavery in Egypt. And for us as followers of Jesus, he sets us free from sin and the slavery to the ultimate Pharaoh of, of Satan. And so we practice Sabbath as a reminder that God has set us free and we're adopted as sons and daughters, and we're not slaves. So Sabbath is a gift. Sabbath is a reminder. Number three, Sabbath is a commandment. In Exodus chapter 20, as well as in Deuteronomy chapter 5, it's one of the Ten Commandments. It made the top ten list. Uh, I've said it before in sermons, and you've probably heard me say this, but if we treated other commandments with as much uh, kind of you know, lackadaisicalness, if that's a word, uh, as we treat the commandment to Sabbath, well, probably a lot of us would need to have some sort of church discipline in our lives. That This is a command from the Lord that, yes, it's a gift, and yes, it's a reminder, but it is also a commandment. We need to take seriously the commands of the Lord because we know that his commands are not burdensome. We know that his commands are always given to be a blessing for us. So Sabbath's a gift. Sabbath is a reminder that we've been set free. Sabbath is a commandment that we should obey. And number four, Sabbath is a signpost pointing us forward to the ultimate rest that we're going to have in the presence of Jesus forever. The, the, the author of Hebrews in his, in his letter in, in Hebrews chapter four, he says, there still remains this ultimate Sabbath rest for the people of God. So every time we practice a Sabbath, we are reminding ourselves not only of what happened in the past, but what is yet to come for us as followers of Jesus. So those are my four reasons, biblically, why we should make Sabbath important in our lives, a regular part of our spiritual habits or spiritual disciplines. It's a gift, it's a reminder, it's a commandment, and it's a signpost looking forward. So then the next question is, okay, well, how? Uh, you know, we in American culture, we are active, on the go. Uh, we have we have 24-hour grocery stores. We have 24-hour television. We have constant internet access and electricity and lights, and we really don't live according to the rhythms of nature very well. So maybe you're asking, how do I Sabbath? From a biblical perspective, what do I even do? And I've got four more things for you to consider, okay? The first one is this. You have to stop. In Leviticus chapter 23, we went over this in, in the book of Leviticus this last fall, but 
Some translation, it says, you know, on, on the Sabbath day, you shall stop from your work. And some translations include, you shall cease from your regular work, your regular labors. And so, for example, for me, prepping a sermon, um, I have made it be a very intentional thing. Regu prepping a sermon is my regular work, and I've made it be a very intentional habit that I do not work on the, on the sermon from sundown Friday night till sundown on Saturday night. I wait until after dinner with the family and maybe we put the kids to bed. And if I need to go over my sermon a little bit more on Saturday night to be ready for Sunday morning, I'll do that. But from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, I've made that uh, checking emails. Uh, I've made it a, a discipline to say, here are the things I'm going to stop doing. I will not do these things because they're part of my regular work. So I know that for some of you, that's like, that's a lot of a lot of preparation that's a lot of discipline yeah there is the discipline aspect to say i need to stop and i need to uh, i need to not do my usual regular work so number one is stop number two is rest and if you'll allow me to meddle a little bit uh, binge watching tv shows on netflix isn't really restful it's kind of like you know cotton candy might make you feel full for a minute but in the end it just wears off and you end up feeling terrible and I've got a really bad story from when one of my kids was younger and I let them have too much cotton candy and they threw up that cotton candy on a bunk bed and it like turned into a cascading waterfall. It's a terrible story. So you need to rest. You need to do things that are actually restful for your soul. What are the things that, that help you to genuinely be replenished in the Lord? Maybe it's going for a walk or communing in nature. Maybe it's um, taking a nap. Maybe it's reading a good book. Maybe you like to slowly, you know, um, prep a cup of coffee or a cup of tea instead of just going through the drive through line at a, at a coffee shop or Starbucks. What are those things that, that really help you to rest? Because in Genesis chapter 2 verse 3, it says that God himself rested. He ceased from his labors and he rested. And we know that God, you know, he, he doesn't get tired, but he modeled that for us as his image bearers, as his creation that we might follow in his example. So the first thing you need to do is stop. You have to put down a list of things. Here's the things I'm not going to do. The second thing is, here's the things I'm going to do that will actually give me rest. And the third thing is actually to delight. To delight, and I would even say specifically to delight in God's good creation. In Genesis 1, 31, right before he Sabbath rests, it says that God looked at everything that he made and behold, it was very good. That God sees all of the stuff that he did, all the creation he made, and he delighted in it. So it's not just stopping, it's not just resting, but it's delighting. What sorts of things help you revel in in God's good creation. And I, I do even specifically emphasize nature and creation and, and, and getting out and you know going on a hike or seeing the, the ocean or walking through the woods or or going out if you're an artistic person, going out and you know drawing something of nature. I think that we we lose a lot in our modern society because of our disconnection from nature. And so I would encourage you towards that idea of delighting in the creation that God made. And then lastly, fourth, worship. Again, in that, the Ten Commandments, in Exodus chapter 20, it says that God commanded the Sabbath day for us to keep it holy. And so we want to have a God focus on our Sabbath day. We want to have a, a, an intentional time set aside where we read our Bible or we spend some more time in prayer or we spend some time in silence and, and just being still before the Lord. Or, or what are those ways that help you connect with God? A worshipful aspect of keeping your Sabbath day holy. So, so you have to stop. You have to say, here's the things I'm not going to do. You have to rest. Say, here's the thing that really helped me recover and, and to be rested. Number three, you have to delight. You get to delight in the creation that God has made. And number four, you get to worship and connect with the God who made you. And so lastly, this, this kind of raises some practical sorts of questions, right? Like, what, what do I do practically? And, and what do the kids have to eat? Do I not feed them? And, 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 and you need to be able to look at your schedule and your life and say, yeah, this, this will be kind of intentionally disruptive. If we're really practicing Sabbath. Yeah, it's a little bit challenging. But it's, again, remember, the commandments of the Lord are not burdensome. And the Sabbath is not uh, some thing that we're now slaves to. It's a gift to us. So we, you know, the people of Israel would prepare for six days and then not cook any food on the seventh day. They just had to rely upon the provision that the Lord had already provided for them. So let me just offer you a few quick practical thoughts um, by way of encouragement and just for things to, to think about. So number one, I really want to encourage you to set aside a 24-hour period 
uh, the, 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 the biblical marker is from sundown on Friday till sundown on Saturday. That's how the Lord commanded it to the people of Israel. And, and while there is for sure flexibility with what day you practice it on, uh, I think it's really important to say, here's a 24 hour period where I will not do my usual work and I will delight and I will rest and I will worship. You know, it's uh, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament says, look, don't let anyone pass judgment on you when it, re when it comes to the Sabbath day. He says, you know, some people consider each day the same. Other people have, have opinions on days. In fact, you can go back into other Jewish writings like the, the Midrashes and, the, and the, the, you know, the stuff, the intertestamental books, and you can see that even the, the people before the, the New Testament was ever written, the people of God would figure out things like, hey, we need doctors to be on hand during these times. So they would practice a Sabbath on a different day. And all of that is totally okay to be flexible with. But I do want to encourage you to set aside a 24-hour period. The next thing I want to encourage you is maybe do something that would help you mark the beginning and the end of it. For the people of Israel, there's a prayer that's prayed and wine that is poured and bread that is broken. And others like to light a candle or some, I've heard of people, you know, kind of uh, like they flip, a, they flip a card over that goes from, you know, red to green or something like that. I don't know, some sort of thing to mark the beginning and the end, okay? Next practical encouragement is don't be legalistic about it, right? Uh, we see that the Pharisees, uh, they, really, they really rubbed Jesus the wrong way because they kept adding things to the commandments of God. They, they made certain legalistic rules. Jesus said, look, is it, is it lawful to help somebody on the Sabbath? If your donkey falls into a pit, wouldn't you help you know, get it out? Like It's totally lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So don't be legalistic. And yet at the same time, do try your best to protect it and to cherish it. The Sabbath is a gift from God. And, and I just want to make an invitation for you to consider putting some emphasis and putting some priority on this in the new year. So to help you with that, we've actually put together a, a, a little one-page document, and it has those four things, <clears throat> the stop, rest, delight, and worship, and some lines where you can actually write things out. You know, for those of you who are married, write it out with a spouse. For those of you who are single, write it out with a close friend or someone in your community group and say, hey, here's the things I'm committing to not doing on my Sabbath. Here's when my Sabbath is. Here's what I won't do. Here's the things that really do fill me with rest. Here's how I'm going to connect with God. Here's how I'm going to enjoy his good creation. And so we've got this document. We'll have some paper versions of it here on Sundays for a while. We have PDFs that you can um, get as well. But I just want to invite you to consider here in, in this new year how you might practice this important spiritual discipline in a way that reminds you that though you were once a slave in Egypt, you are now set free. And when Jesus returns, you will experience that Sabbath rest for eternity. So I love you, church, and invite you to consider how you might join with our God once a week in this radical practice known as Sabbathing.